So I'll be talking today about modeling risk for schizophrenia using stem cells, but I wanted to start with this uh, broader question. It, it arises from, from what Evan said as well, and, and the question then is, what if we switched from a diagnosis-based to a genotype-first approach for neuropsychiatric disease? What if we stopped using words like schizophrenia and bipolar and started treating these diseases based on the genetics of each patient? And so what I'm really talking about here is precision medicine. It requires knowing all of the genetic risk factors uh, carried by a patient and how they interact to impact not just diagnosis, but also treatment response. And I'm going to talk to you today in the context of schizophrenia, but everything that I tell you I think will also apply to bipolar, autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and, and really many of our complex genetic neuropsychiatric diseases. So why schizophrenia? Uh, my lab focuses on schizophrenia because it's incredibly common. About 1% of people in every country and every society are affected by this disorder, including 3 million Americans. This is a big problem. The effects are quite severe. One in 10 patients will commit suicide. One in two will have a drug or alcohol abuse problem. Nine out of 10 will not hold a full-time job after they're diagnosed, and one in five will live in the streets. Uh, this is a, a severe disorder that takes people out of society and for which there is no cure. The estimates uh, of heritability of this disease are quite high, and the more recent estimates are actually closer to 85%. So what does this really mean, these heritability estimates? It means that schizophrenia is more heritable than autism and bipolar, more heritable than ADHD, than BRCA1 breast cancer, than alcoholism. And this heritability is, is complex, as I hinted at earlier. It reflects both rare and common variants. So, th so these rare variants uh, tend to be highly penetrant. You are very unlikely to be a control if you have one of these copy number variations. These are very big deletions or duplications. And we've got about a dozen of them identified to date with genome-wide significance. There are also hundreds of common variants linked to schizophrenia. Any one of these has a very small effect, but we understand that for most patients, disease arises as the complex interaction between these common variants. Uh, the most recent publication has identified 105 of them. There's almost 250 in the unpublished PGC, and estimates are that when all is said and done, there could be as many as 1,000 common variants linked to schizophrenia. So I talk today will have two parts. First, we'll talk about one of these uh, highly penetrant rare mutations, and then we'll talk about efforts in my lab to validate these, the impact of these common variations. Uh, so rare copy number variants linked to schizophrenia show variable penetrance and severity. The most common CNV is at 22Q11.2. A third of these carriers will have psychosis, but none of them will be controls. I'll talk to you today about one, uh, a CNV at 2P16.3. Of all these CNVs, this one here is unique because it's the only one that directly impacts just one gene, norexin 1. But it's also a very interesting example because this gene is one of the most highly alternatively spliced genes in the human genome. The mouse data suggests there are hundreds of isoforms, and where we really began was asking if this was true in humans, and if so, how did deletions at this locus impact the alternative splicing repertoire? So this is work led by a PhD student in my lab, Erin Flaherty. Some of you may be receiving postdoc applications from her in the next week or two. You should definitely meet her. She's amazing. Uh, and the analysis was led by Xu Zhu, who is a postdoc in Gong Fang's lab. So then our first question was, how, was how is norexin 1 alternatively spliced in the postmortem brain? So you cannot look at this by Illumina short read sequencing alone. The reads at just 120 base pairs are too short to span the entire gene. And so we had to integrate here a, a SmartSeq, a long read isoform sequencing approach that also integrated short read sequencing to verify uh, the reads in the most rigorous way possible. So across three postmortem brains, we found evidence of 162 high confidence Rex and one isoforms. Across one fetal co cortex, we found evidence of 75. And across three control IPS neuron populations, we found evidence of 103 norexin-1 isoforms. 
And so when we look more closely at these 103 isoforms found in the IPS neurons, 80% of them were also detected in brain tissue, and we captured about 63% of the fetal repertoire. And so this, I think, is the first time that somebody asked if alternative splicing in the brain can be captured in vitro. And so we're happy to report, yes, for the most part, we do see complex anorexin-1 splicing in IPS-derived neurons. So this is all in controls. Now I wanted to know what happened when we move into patients. Uh, so this is the anorexin-1 locus. We're talking about very big deletions, about 100 megabases. And yet, even still, they're impacting a small amount of the coding sequence. So we've got two patients with five prime deletions that impact the promoter in exons one and two, and two patients with three prime deletions impacting three exons towards the end of the gene. So can we identify differences in neurons from these patients versus controls? This is our, our first peek at uh, neurite branching in the neurons, and so we do see significant deficits, perhaps stronger in the five prime patients, um, but reduced in both cases relative to the controls. And here's a, a look at neural activity. So this is um, population-wide neural activity. It's measured by the Axiom uh, multiplexer array. And so what you can see in the controls is that as the neurons get older, they st start to fire more. And this is not surprising to any of you who work with IPS-derived neurons. But what you'll know is the patients, the five prime patients are averaged in the blue, the three prime patients average in red. With time, those neurons do not increase activity to the same extent as controls. Uh, we did this first in six-week-old or uh, IPS forebrain neurons or a mixture of excitatory and inhibitory neurons, but we repeated it in NGN2 neurons. And so again, with time, the controls fire more, and you just don't see that same increase in patients with either genotype. So this really leaves you with one question, and that is, to what extent do these phenotypes reflect perturbations in few or many norexin-1 isoforms? Asked another way, are these neurons firing less because they're receiving a 50% dose decrease in the norexin-1 isoforms of all 100 and so uh, isoforms we've seen in IPS neurons? Are they acting differently because just one critical isoform is down 50% and the others didn't really matter? Or are they acting differently because there's a dominant negative effect from new isoforms formed by brand, uh, splicing around the deletion? And so we went to look at this, again, using smart read sequencing. So this is a, a PCA, again, looking at uh, the norexin one isoform in postmortem brain, in fetal brain, in control IPS neurons, and now in patient IPS neurons. And so you can see that the patients have a dramatic impact on norexin one splicing. I can show you that data better in, in this schematic. And so here, uh, we've got exons from one all the way through the gene. When they're present in an isoform, you get a colored block, and when they're being skipped, you see a white. And so what we've got at the top of this is the most abundant isoforms in the patients. What we've got at the bottom is the most abundant isoforms in the controls. So you can see abundance here in patients and controls, and whether they were validated in a controlled postmortem brain sample on the far right. And so in red are the 41 unique isoforms from the mutant allele that we only see in patient IPS neurons, that we never see in control IPS neurons, and that we never see in the control postmortem brain. And in orange are those shared isoforms that we see in both patients and controls, but are more than twofold changed in the patient neurons. So by and large, these isoforms are abundantly expressed in the controls, uh, with decreased expression in patients, and most of them are validated in the postmortem brain. And in gray are actually isoforms that we only see in control IPS neurons and not in patients at all. So we wanted to ask again, could we confirm that these were being translated? And how did these individual isoforms impact function? So Erin spent the summer topo cloning with a high school student. She, she pulled out full-length deletion on control isoforms, put them into lentiviral overexpression cassettes, and, and tagged them. Uh, with a, with a MIC tag. And so we can show that uh, the patient and the control isoforms are being translated. And we can go back to the multiplexer array to ask how they impact neuronal uh, activity rates. And so here are the control neurons, the five prime deletion neurons, and the three prime deletion neurons. On the left is when we just overexpress a BFP. And on the right, when we overexpress a control isoform. So if you put one extra control isoform into the controls, you get a trend to more activity, but it's not significant. But in these five prime uh, patients, you can rescue the activity deficits by adding back just one norexin-1 isoform. So they're missing almost 50 isoforms, but giving back just one is sufficient to rescue activity in this assay. 
Um, but it also gets at the impact of genotype and phenotype, because those patients with three prime deletions were not rescued. And this might get at the fact that their deletion also includes norexin 1 beta as well as norexin 1 alpha transcripts, and we didn't rescue that. But even more interesting than this data, which suggested a dose response in these gray and orange isoforms, is, is the last bit when we overexpress these red mutant isoforms. So, and we've only tested one to date, but when you overexpress these mutant isoforms in controls, you're actually able to fully uh, decrease activity to patient levels. And so this suggests not only that there's a dose response going on in some of these patients, but there might be a dominant negative effect from some of these mutant isoforms as well. And so it really changes the way we think about the mechanism of this rare mutation impacting neurons. Uh, and with that, I'm, I'm going to change topics altogether and move towards common variants. Um, and this is a really interesting landscape because the Manhattan plots are just getting more and more dense with time. In 2014, there were 108 loci associated with schizophrenia. Today, as I said earlier, there's 145. And what you're looking at here are those single nucleotide polymorphisms, so just single base pair substitutions that are associated for risk with schizophrenia in a large European cohort. Um, this is the genome-wide significance here. This is the MHC, oh, pointer is really trying to die here, MHC cluster. And then the question really is, so how many of these SNPs are actually, oh, thank you, Evan, um, linked to uh, changes in gene expression? Uh, and what I'm really asking here is about cis-EQTL. So how often is this piece of DNA regulating the gene expression of the nearest neighbor gene? And you can ask that looking at postmortem uh, gene expression signatures. Um, and, and this is based on the Common Mind Consortium of about 600 brains. So now we've got two Manhattan plots. Here we're asking about uh, risks of schizophrenia, and here we're asking about the significance of that SNP to impact expression of the nearest neighbor gene. Um, and of course, many of these SNPs are in uh, linkages equilibrium, so there's never just, it's never simple, right? There's never just one SNP near that gene, there's always many of them. So I'm going to give you an example of two genes from these Manhattan plots and how the data can look. Because as a stem cell biologist, it's great that the genesis have 108, but I can't test all 108. So how do you prioritize which ones to go after? Um, so what you'll see here is we've got the, the top Manhattan plot, the GWAS on the y-axis, and the bottom Manhattan plot, the EQTLs, on the x-axis. So we're really asking how often is the, single, is the most significant SNP for genetics also the single most significant SNP for postmortem gene expression regulation. And here for furin, it's actually really clean. There's uh, one putative causal EQTL. The same SNP that seems to be conferring risk for schizophrenia also seems to be regulating expression of furin. For SNP91, the answer is much more muddled. There's about 30 SNPs grouped together in that top right corner. And, and what we don't know then is whether there's one uh, SNP in that 30 that's giving 100% of the effect, or if each of those 30 SNPs is contributing 3% of schizophrenia risk. And so if you're going to go in with CRISPR editing to test the impact of the common variants, it makes a lot of sense to start here with furin and not a lot of sense to start here with SNAP91. And so it's really important as a stem cell biologist that you're constantly engaging with the geneticists who really understand the associations between disease risk and postmortem gene expression before you dive in. So there's really two questions here that I think a stem cell biologist can add to the genetic studies that are ongoing. And the first one is, does a change in EQTL and SNP genotype impact expression of the nearest neighbor gene? And the second is, if you change expression of that gene, does that do anything to neuronal or astrocyte function? Now, before I go into the data, I want to show you what we actually based uh, the last three years of work on. And, and I want to really drive home how brave I think the postdoc who led this work is. Because this is what the postmortem data looked like. Across the three or the 600 postmortem brains, those that had an AA genotype at this risk SNP had expression levels here for furin. And those that had the GG risky allele had expression levels here. This is the most significant hit in the entire postmortem data set. But look at these error bars, right? If you were the postdoc going in to target this AA to this GG, uh, this sort of data should give you pause. And, and so I do want to clear up that we had a hypothesis going in. And our hypothesis was that the data would be cleaner in an if-space comparison. 
Here the results are confounded by the fact that every brain had a different genetic background, every brain had a patient who died a different way, half of these brains came from patients with schizophrenia and half didn't, many of these brains had antipsychotic or drug or alcohol abuse, and so our hope was that if we did it on isogenic neurons where nothing but this single SNP was different, we would see the same effect size but dramatically reduced error bars. Um, and so this was the hypothesis upon which Nadine uh, based the last three years of her life. Now this edit was not easy. We're talking about a single non-coding SNP. You can't use any of the regular uh, cheats like putting in selection or changing the PAM because those are non-coding SNPs too. So it took her several rounds of amplification to even increase the number of events to allow her to clone them out. She confirmed them by RFLP and by Sanger sequencing, ultimately arriving at a perfectly edited AA um, and, and GG ips, as well as many mistakes along the way where there was a deletion instead of a perfect edit. And so in the ips, there's no change of expression with fear and genotype, but in seven day old neurons and 21 day old NGN2 neurons, you actually see about a 30% reduction in fear and levels when you change just a single non coding SNP. And so I actually think it's, it's a quite remarkable proof of concept here that she changed a SNP not in the gene and showed changes of expression that were as large as 30%. Now we haven't finished the functional validation. I can't tell you how this decrease in expression impacts astrocyte neuronal function, but I can tell you that I think it will based on some work that we published a few years ago. Here we actually just cheated. We knocked down furin by short hairpin RNA and we asked how that changed neural migration. And so we have qPCR to match with each of these neurosphere migration assays. And I can tell you that our weakest effect was in control one, where we only had a 30% fear and knockdown by short hairpin. And so given that even this individual showed an impact in migration, we knocked down fear, and I think there's a reasonable chance that we'll be able to show that a single edit of a single non-coding SNP might impact a cellular function. Now changing gears, what do we do for all the genes that are not furin? For all those genes where there's 30 or 50 or 100 SNPs in LD and you don't know which one to edit? And so here we're turning to a second CRISPR-based uh, approach. Rather than CRISPR editing of a single SNP, we're going straight to the second question. What happens if we change gene expression? So this is CRISPR activation or inhibition by a DCAS9 fused to a transcriptional activator or repressor. When we do this in 21-day-old NGN2 neurons, we can see that for the most part we get a modest effect sizes. Two to three-fold increases and about 50% reductions across our top four candidate genes. That's actually kind of nice. These are much more endogenous perturbations than you would get from lentiviral overexpression or short hairpin knockdown for the most part. When we do RNA-seq, and here I'm just showing you for two of the genes, SNAP91 and T-snare, you can see that we're perturbing our target genes and that in some conditions we get more or fewer downstream genes changing in response to these perturbations. This is just a PCA across two donors just to drive home the, po the point that genetic background matters. Uh, the largest effect size, 94% of the variants of these CRISPR A and I perturbations are actually donor one and donor two. And so it's really important that you make these changes within, or make these comparisons within genetic background. And so we can see the effect of perturbing SNAP91 and T-snare in each donor. When you, when you compare within donor first, uh, some really interesting findings begin to fall out of the RNA-seq. Uh, for example, Two of our perturbations actually showed a, a significant enrichment of shared downstream targets, and these downstream targets form protein-protein interaction networks. And I think this is the first hint that there might be functional convergence between different common variant associated genes. And diving in further to SNAP91, we can see that reciprocal changes, activation and repression of SNAP91, lead to reciprocal correlations with postmortem gene expression patterns. Um, showing a negative and a positive association with schizophrenia, and that by EFIS, these same reciprocal perturbations lead to reciprocal uh, synaptic phenotypes in the postsynaptic neuron. And so I think this really lets us go from genetics all the way to synapse. And while it's just one or two common variant genes here, I think now we have a pipeline that we hope to be able to expand to really understand the impact of these common variants and how they converge across different genetic backgrounds. And so what I think I've learned over the last two or three years is that we can do better when we design an IPS-based study. Um, when I started with Rusty as a postdoc, uh, too long ago now, 
we were, we were thinking about this in terms of case control analysis. We didn't know anything about the genetics of schizophrenia really at the time, and this sort of basic design captures both the known and unknown, rare and or common variants contributing to risk in each donor. It captures the effect of genetic background and penetrance. Now we knew we were probably going to see small effect sizes between cases and controls, but I think we really underestimated how much heterogeneity there was between patients and between controls, and how much this heterogeneity would make studies, especially of common variants of small effect size, really difficult. And so moving forward, we've got, I think, a better design where we're integrating CRISPR editing into this case control structure. So we can ask what the impact of this patient-specific rare or common variant is in this control, or this control, or this patient. And so now by combining genetic cohorts and CRISPR editing, we can do isogenic comparisons of the effect of rare and or common variants. Our small effect sizes can be balanced by reduced standard deviation, and the heterogeneity between patients and controls has become an asset, because now we retain our ability to capture the effect of genetic background and penetrance in a way that we can test hypotheses across backgrounds. So I want to close with a big picture question, and that is, what if it was easier to prevent schizophrenia rather than treat it? Um, this can seem outlandish, right? But um, as we get better at genetics, as we get better at understanding the interaction between genetic variants, it seems likely that we'll be able to diagnose schizophrenia before symptom onset. It makes intuitive sense that you'd rather treat Alzheimer's before the neurons are dead, and it should also make intuitive sense that you would rather treat schizophrenia before there's reinforcement of aberrant circuit behavior. Um, and so I think it, this requires two things. One, diagnosing earlier, and two, having new sets of therapeutic targets. Um, and, and I like to give you the example of neural tube defects. I can't think of anything more severe than being born with a, a head or a spinal cord that, a brain or a spinal cord that didn't close. Uh, these are brain defects with no pill to treat them. Uh, the luckiest of patients have a good surgeon who can close th these defects. Um, but there's no cure for neural tube defects, but there is a prevention. Since 1992, we've recommended that all pregnant women take folic acid supplements, and it's brought the rate of neural tube defects almost to zero in this country. In fact, it proved so safe and so effective that every single one of us is given a folic acid supplement every day when we have our toast at breakfast. Uh, now, I'm not saying that we're going to find a treatment for schizophrenia so safe and so effective as folic acid, but what if we could? What if something as simple as a vitamin is out there just waiting for us to uncover? And so towards that, we've begun to do some uh, drug screening. I don't have time to go into this, but luckily the data is uh, in press. It should be out into the world soon. Um, and what we're talking about here is our first transcriptomic-based drug screening. Rather than looking at something hard like synaptic density or synaptic activity, we're looking at gene expression. And in, in this study, we did it across uh, 12 patient NPCs, neural progenitor cells, and 12 control ips derived NPCs and eight cancer cell lines. We tested 135 drugs. We learned a couple of really obvious things. Classical screening lines are, in fact, different than neural cell lines. Um, in smaller ways, uh, patient and control cell lines are different. And all of these lines respond mostly the same to most drugs, but a little bit different to a few of the drugs. And so here's an example of a few drugs that impacted control and patient NPCs differently. Um, and on average, more often than not, when we had drugs that impacted cancer cells and NPCs differently, they were enriched for genes associated with schizophrenia, which makes sense. These neural cells are you know, more likely, I think, to be impacted there. And even with patient control comparisons, when drugs differentially impacted patient and control NPCs, they were again enriched for either genes associated with schizophrenia by postmortem studies, or here's one drug also associated with schizophrenia risk from the genetic studies. And so I think this is a really powerful data set that I'm really excited to share um, with the world, hopefully really soon. And to close before I run out of time, um, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that I think uh, uh, case control, postmortem, and if space studies will likely be underpowered for the near future, uh, but fortuitously, uh, postmortem and if space studies show significant overlap in data that I didn't have a chance to show you today. Um, and isogenic approaches will power meaningful analysis to verify the causal variants identified by these genomic analyses. 
and transcriptomic based screening can uncover schizophrenia relevant drug induced changes in a cell type and diagnosis specific uh, manner. And so with that, the most important slide in my deck is this one. If these guys weren't in lab pipetting every single day, I'd have nothing to show you um, for a talk. And without these funding agencies and all of these collaborators, um, there, there really wouldn't be anything. This is a, a team science in the truest sense. So thank you all. So we're open for questions. I guess you're entirely clear. Going easy on me, guys. <laughs> um, for, from your drug screen, though, did anything jump out that you think could be this folate? Uh, I, I'm going to be honest. If we had found the cure for schizophrenia in that screen, I would have <laughs> talked about it a lot more. I think what we learned is how difficult these drug screens can be, how complex the data sets are. Um, it was a lot of small insights about the value of testing across genetic backgrounds and on cell types relevant to disease, but no folic acid yet. I think we've got to test a few more drugs. And, and have any of them mapped to actual fundamental neuronal function? You're talking about protein function. No, I think what we were able to show in this study is that uh, the post-mortem schizophrenia signatures we saw in the Common Mind data set, to a small extent, could be reversed by, you know, a few of these drugs, and those same drugs were the ones that impact the schizophrenia risk. So there's a convergence of biology, but I think the bottom line is on a per dollar basis, if you're going to go about transcriptomic screen, one should focus on a cell type relevant to disease and on genetic backgrounds relevant to disease, and that's the big take home of the story. So Steve Goldman has found the importance of glial cells mm -hmm. in this, and anything that would support what his finding was in these animals? So this was all in neural progenitor cells. Uh, the right. original plan was to go back and redo the screen in both neurons and astrocytes. We right. just spent a million dollars on that one and ran oh. out before <laughs> we could keep going. Well, great. Thanks so much. Thank that you. was great. Evan, I have a question. Oh, OK. Yeah, so um, thanks for the talk. Uh, so looking at like the single CNVs or SNPs, um, and you were screening like with CRISPR and single ones, and you thought, saw a 30% change in one. Um, but a lot of them should be sort of combination, combinatorial. So, so how do you imagine going about that if, like, basically your search space would be really high? So I was surprised by how few of the genes at this point have single SNPs for editing. I think, well, I'm sure, the geneticists are sure that as we get more brains in the postmortem, as the EQTL analysis is better powered, um, more will come through. So it's not as bad as it seems right now. We just don't have enough data. So the short term is we're really focusing on this CRISPR A and I platform. There's new Cas9 effectors that are actually more scalable, um, that you could do actual combinatorial perturbations in both directions in the same cell. Right now we're limited to one direction and one guide or one gene. But uh, the stuff that uh, my postdocs in the lab are currently working on are how far can we scale? Can we get to 10, 20, 50, 100 genes? And, and that's, I think, where it's going to get really interesting really fast. That's really cool. Thanks. Okay.